Hello, here I am again in the name of the Sovereign Creator of Heaven and Earth, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm continuing with my exposition of my translation of Acts. We've come now to chapter 16, verse 35. You recall that we are in Philippi, and uh, Paul and Silas have spent the night in prison. There was the earthquake and, and so on and such. So now we come to the next morning. <coughs> Now when it was day, the magistrate sent the officers, saying, Let those men go. So the jailer reported these words to Paul. The magistrates have sent to release you, so now you can leave and go in peace. But Paul said to them, After severely beating us in public, although we are uncondemned Romans, they threw us into prison. And now do they toss us out on the sly? No way. Rather, let them come themselves and escort us out. So the officers reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. And they came and appealed to them, and leading them out, they asked them to leave the city. So, departing from the prison, they entered Lydia's place, and upon seeing the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. Interesting that uh, Paul decides to teach those magistrates a lesson. Verse 37, Paul said to them, that's what the text says, that's because the officers were still there. The officers were there to see what would happen, and so they were able to take the message from Paul back to the magistrates as they did. And so they came, in verse 39, and they were very polite. They appealed to them, led them out, as Paul had insisted, insisted they should. <laughs> but then they asked him to leave the city. Oh, please, won't you just go ahead and leave the city? Which they did <clears throat> after they had gone and encouraged the brothers, who no doubt were very sad at what had happened to Paul and Silas. Now we come to chapter 17 <clears throat> and Thessalonica. I will read verses 1 through 4 to begin. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. So Paul, as was his custom, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, <clears throat> explaining and demonstrating that the Messiah had to suffer and rise again from the dead and that this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Messiah. Some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of devout Greeks and not a few of the prominent women. There's nothing unusual here to comment on. This was Paul's standard procedure. He always began with the synagogue if there was one, trying to convince the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah, and what happened to Jesus was had been prophesied, and so it had to happen. And always coming back to the being raised from the dead, that was an absolutely essential part of the message. And verse 4 says that there was a good number, mainly Greeks, Gentiles, that, as a matter of fact, believed and joined Paul and Silas. So now we come to the other half, verses 5 through 9. But the disobedient Jews rounded up some wicked men from the marketplace, and forming a mob, they created an uproar in the city and attacking the house of Jason, where they wanted to bring them out to the crowd. But not finding them, they dragged Jason and some other brothers before the city officials, vociferating, These who have upset the whole world have come here too, to whom Jason has given lodging. These all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. Well, they agitated the crowd and the city officials when they heard these things. Then they took a security bond from Jason and the rest and let them go. I'm interested in the word disobedient in verse 5. What does Paul mean when he says the disobedient Jews? Paul, no, this was, uh, sorry, Luke writing. <clears throat> I would say that these were Jews that were who were fundamentally disobedient to God, 
And so they fell in with Satan's, Satan's agenda. Some 20% of the Greek manuscripts add becoming envious. But uh, those 20% do so in a variety of ways, and the confusion is reflected in the versions. doesn't make much difference in this case. <coughs> I'm really... <laughs> I'm impressed by the accusation here in verse 6. These who have upset the whole world. Now, that was not intended as a compliment. <laughs> we understand that. But, you know, I personally wouldn't mind having that on my, that epitaph on my tombstone, if I ever have one. <laughs> you know, set the world upside down. Hey, that's not bad. <laughs> Well, poor Jason, who was putting them up, he got dragged out because they couldn't find Paul and Silas. And after everything was said and done in verse 9, all they did was take a, a security bond. They had to put down some money, and then they let them go. That is Jason and the rest. Now we come to verses 10 through 15, which will be about Berea. Immediately during the night, the brothers sent both Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all goodwill, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things might be so. Therefore, many of them believed, <clears throat> and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was also being proclaimed by Paul and Berea, they came to agitating the crowds. So then, without delay, the brothers sent Paul away as if to go by sea, while both Silas and Timothy remained there. But those who were conducting Paul actually took him all the way to Athens and receiving a command to Silas and Timothy that they should come to him as quickly as possible, they started back. They leave Thessalonica at night, get to Berea, probably the, that have to be on Saturday that they went into the synagogue. You know, I, I say to myself, I wonder how come Paul wrote two letters to the church in Thessalonica and not to Berea. You know, I would have thought that the Bereans would be more deserving of some letters than the Thessalonians, but maybe he did, but they weren't inspired and didn't enter into the canon. But I like these Bereans. They, they accepted it. They were listening with care, but then they examined the scriptures every day to see if that's really the way it was. I like that. That's good. That's great. I take off my hat to the Bereans. So, of course, since uh, the scriptures bore out what Paul was proclaiming, so they believed, of course. But then, of course, comes the people from Thessalonica, and we have the story all over again. Verse 14 is interesting. The brothers there in Berea deliberately did a, a, an action to throw the pursuit off the scent. They acted like they were taking Paul to the, to the shore to put him on a boat. But as a matter of fact, at some point, they took off and picked up the main road to Athens, and they went with Paul, walked with him all the way to Athens. Now, we have no way of knowing where Paul stayed in Athens, but it's quite possible that the Bereans that took him had friends, had parents, had uh, relatives, had someone that they knew in Athens, and they had a, a particular address where they delivered Paul. Because, you see, when Paul sends a message back with him for Silas and Timothy to come to him as quickly as possible, obviously Silas and Timothy would have to have an address, you know, where are they going to find Paul in the city of Athens? That's just a surmise, but it seems to me perfectly logical that that had to be the way it was. Anyway, now we come to Athens. 
I'm going to read just verses 16 through 21, saving the Areopagus address for the next paragraph. Now, while Paul was waiting for them, that is to say for Silas and Timothy, in Athens, his spirit was increasingly aroused within him as he observed the city was full of idols. So he reasoned both in the synagogue with the Jews and devout persons and in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. Then certain philosophers, both Epicureans and Stoics, encountered him. Some said, what might this idea scavenger want to say? Others said, he seems to be proclaim a proclaimer of foreign deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. So taking him in tow, they led him to the Areopagus and said, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? Because you are bringing some strange things to our ears, and we would like to know what they, are, what they might mean. Now all Athenians, this is within parentheses, now all Athenians and resident foreigners spent their time in nothing else but to tell, or else to hear, some novelty. Athens was full of idols, and this bothered Paul. <laughs> and he tried reasoning with the Jews, that would be on the, on the Saturdays, but every day in the marketplace he would try to talk to anyone who, who would stop and listen. And then one day, verse 18, some philosophers came by. There were two groups of them, Epicureans and Stoics. And some said, what might this idea scavenger want to say? The word here, <laughs> the term here in Greek is not nice. They were not trying to be nice. This was, uh, this was an, uh, an insult, like a, a scavenger going after whatever a scavenger can find. An idea scavenger. In other words, they didn't really think that he had much to say. But others, well, he seems to be proclaiming foreign deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Now, in verse 19, they are more educated, if I may put it that way. <laughs> Here they are, they are reasonably polite, at least. Look, you know, may we know what this teaching is, that you, are, you know, because you are bringing some strange things to our ears. So they were, they were reasonably polite at that point. And that we would like to know what they might mean. Okay. Verse 21 is a curious comment on the mindset in Athens. All Athenians and the resident foreigners, not just the Athenians, the resident foreigners, spent their time in nothing else but to tell or else to hear some novelty. That was all we wanted. We just wanted to hear or tell something new. But obviously then they were not really concerned about truth. They just wanted something new. And every day you want something new. And we will find Paul decided that he wasn't getting anywhere there, and he moved on to Corinth. But in the first place, we have to hear his Areopagus address. That's verses 22 through 31. So standing in the middle of the Areopagus, Paul said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious, because as I went along and scrutinized the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to unknown God. Now then, the one you worship as unknown, this is the one I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples built by hands. Neither is he cared for by men's hands as though he needed anything, since he himself has always given life and breath to all. And from one blood he made every ethnic nation of men to dwell on all the surface of the earth, having determined the appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Because in him we live and move and have our being as also some of your own proper, your own poets have said. 
quote, for we are also his offspring, end quote. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divinity is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by human skill and imagination. Such times of ignorance God did indeed overlook, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the inhabited world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of, all, of this to all by raising him from the dead. So let's go back here and see what Paul says. He starts out by... He's being reasonably nice. Some Bibles say, uh, read, I perceive you all are very superstitious. I don't know if that would really be the best translation. I think I have rendered here very religious. Paul was not there to insult them, you know, right out, right off the, right off the start to say nasty things about them. I don't think he would have put it that way. I imagine he said you are very religious. This was not necessarily bad. So he mentioned all. There was no lack of altars of all kinds, evidently. Also, there would be all sorts of images. But there was one altar, strange altar, that was to unknown God. It's curious that they would have something like that. Although I read once uh, a, bit about, a bit of history, something about there was a reason for why there was that altar there, but I don't remember the details. Some unknown god had done something good for them, and so therefore they had a, an altar to that unknown god. Anyway, that was what Paul picked up as his introduction. He's now going to tell them about that unknown god. And he does hear what he and Barnabas had done back when he was stoned, dealing with uh, pagans, you start with the Creator. I think that's the, exactly the way to start. You start with the sovereign creator. That's what he does here. The God who made the world and everything in it. Lord of heaven and earth. He doesn't dwell in it. He doesn't need stuff made by our hands. He himself has always given life and breath to all. Paul affirms that all of us owe our life to God. Just think about it. All God has to do is just stop your breathing for three or four minutes and you are dead. You know, and we take our breath for granted. <laughs> oh. God gives us breath, and not only to us, but also all the animals. All the animals that breathe, the Creator gives them life and breath as well to all. Now, verse 26 is something that uh, I have to comment on. From one blood he made every ethnic nation that dwell on all the face of the earth. Modern medicine has discovered that this is precisely true. Blood transfusions across racial boundaries are perfectly possible, no problem. So how could Paul know that 2,000 years ago? Divine inspiration. Unfortunately, some 4.5% of the Greek manuscripts omit blood, and they are followed, guess who, NIV, NASB, LBTV, the whole range of modern versions, cut out the word blood. That is very bad. They absolutely should not do that. The text says precisely, one blood, he made every ethnic nation. That is a serious difference or error that we find in the modern versions. Having determined the appointed times and the boundaries of their dwelling. Now, that's a very interesting statement. I wonder uh, if Paul was thinking of Deuteronomy 32, verse 8, and that's why I had to do that bit of gymnastics to get my English Bible here. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 8. When the Most High divided their inheritance to the nations, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the children of Israel. Now, that has given trouble to some people, but 
in First Peter, it says that the God's Lamb with his blood shed was known before the foundation of the world. So God has always known what was going to happen. And he, he knew what the <laughs> inheritance of Jacob was going to be on down the line. He separated the, he set the boundaries of the people. Deuteronomy 32, verse 8. And I imagine that Paul, a good Pharisee who knew Moses' writings very well, thank you, probably was thinking about that. Having determined the appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord only, unfortunately, most of them never did. How could they go up for him and find him? It's just it's a very difficult thing if you have no revelation. You can, you can know from the creation that there has to be a creator, but that's about it. 28. In him we live and move and have our being. That is a fundamental truth, whether people recognize it or not. In God we live and move and have our being. Paul even cites one of their poets, which means that he had done some research on what they thought. We are all his offspring. And he takes that and runs with it, since it happens to be true up to a point, since we are all. If we are God's offspring, then we are like God, okay? Does that make sense? <laughs> If I have a child, that child is sort of like me. So if I have if I have personality, the child will have personality. If I have two arms and two legs, my child will have two arms and so on. Uh, our children tend to be more or less like we, their parents, are. And so this is uh, what Paul is saying. If we are God's offspring, then he must be a little bit like we are, and therefore he is not like gold, silver, and stone. Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> if we have capabilities, God has the same, but he has them only bigger and better. So we should not try to represent the true God with physical objects, something that we shape with our own skill and imagination. God doesn't need that. So he says, well, you know, God overlooked up to some point at least the ignorance of past generations, but now, now that the Savior has come, lived and died and risen from the dead, now God has appointed a day in which he will judge the inhabited world in righteousness by the man who was also the righteous judge whom he has ordained. And he has given assurance of this by raising him from the dead. There again, Without the resurrection of the dead, we don't have a gospel. This is central. And he says that in this case, the resurrection guarantees that we will be judged, only judged righteously. Well, that's the sticking point. <laughs> Satan hates the resurrection, and people controlled by him almost always react adversely to it, as we will find Festus doing in chapter 26. They just don't like to hear about it. <clears throat> and that was the case here. Soon as he says, raising him from the dead, that was the end of his discourse. Reading now verses 32 through 34, which will finish chapter 17. Well, when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some started scoffing, while others said, we will hear you again about this. And with that, Paul went out from them, from among them. However, some men believed and joined him. Among them, Dionysius the Areopagite, and also a woman named Damaris, and others with him. However, when they said, we will hear you again about this, they never did. They had had their opportunity. They never got another one, at least not from Paul, so far as we know. People try to impose their agenda on God. But you know that somehow that this usually does not work. Don't try it because it's not going to work very well. We will see now that Paul just doesn't bother anymore with Athens. He's going to move on to Corinth. Athens was an important city, but it never became the hub of the church for Greece. That was reserved for Corinth. <clears throat> 
a couple, a few people did believe. So there was some fruit there in Athens.